I'm Jasmine Bowen and you are watching the elephant in the room. Today we have a very interesting episode for you. Um, <clears throat> you all know back in historic times the uh, the Catholic Church was definitely doing some not so good stuff. They were very corrupt but what some of you might not know is that some of it is still going on today. So we are joined by Kevin and Annette. Kevin Annette is how you say it? Annette, Annette. Annette. Ah, okay. So welcome to the show. And your organization is what? I work with a group uh, in Canada. It's called Friends and Relatives of the Disappeared. Okay. And uh, I'm also working with a tribunal based in Europe to look into these crimes by the church. Okay. So can you tell us your story, Kevin? I mean, how did you get to where you are today? Well, I was a United Church minister uh, back about 20 years ago. I moved to Port Alberni on the West Coast, and I began to work with the Native people, and they told me very quickly about a lot of crimes that had happened in the local Indian boarding school. Okay. Uh, right, yeah, and th this is how I began to learn these things, including about the death of children. Okay, so, uh, I mean, elaborate on that. What, what led you, because you are, you are no longer with the church, I believe. Well, after about three years looking into the stuff, uh, I was fired and then thrown out of the church. Oh, uh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't just because of discovering these crimes that had happened in the schools. There was a whole history of the church selling off native land oh, to dear. logging companies for kickbacks. I mean, I was beginning to uncover some of that corruption. And, uh, you know, they, they threw me out for that reason, which they admitted later. But um, the thing about that I found is that people who had witnessed killings in these schools were actually coming to my church, getting up and talking about it in church. Okay. And that caused quite a quite a upset, especially among the, some of the white people there. Right. Um, so what led you first to become a minister of the United Church? Well, I've been raised in the United Church in Winnipeg, and uh, I, I wanted to uh, follow my own sense of spiritual calling, but also wanted to do it in a way that would be helping people and I've always worked with you know on political causes and trying to help people on the ground so it seemed like a natural fit for me. Okay so you became a minister um, but shortly after getting into the inner workings of the church you discovered that maybe it wasn't going so well. Well that's right yeah I mean you know it, it, it was kind of hard to believe at first when you hear these things but then I began to find documents and, and other things that confirmed what people were telling me. Right. I mean there's even been documents published in the Globe and Mail four years ago that show that half these children were dying in these schools. Okay. You know, so you don't get half the children dying off unless it's something more than just occasional kids being beaten and raped. I mean there was wow. something else going on. And that this case the the children dying is what led you away from the church? Well, I didn't really begin to learn that until after I was fired and people began to come to me. I think I was trusted more by natives because I had been thrown out of the church. Right. And in the late 90s, I was uh, part of the first group of native people in Vancouver to sue the United Church and the federal government. Wow. And uh, it was uh, the first lawsuit in Canada. And a lot of these things began to come out in court. Mm -hmm. And because of the work I was doing, bringing out this information, eventually there were over 10,000 lawsuits brought against the, the Catholic and the United and the Anglican churches for these crimes. And these were individual families stepping forward? families, people who had been through the schools, and also their children who are, you know, suffer a lot of the bad effects of the fact that their, you know, their parents were traumatized and, and really tortured at a young age and they couldn't be proper parents. So mm -hmm. it really had an enormous ripple effect all through the Aboriginal world. Um, your uh, leaving of the church, was it an honorable discharge or did they come to you and say, get out? <laughs> Oh, they uh, they threw me out without cause. They really? they even went they even went to my wife at the time and said, he's never going to be able to work again. We'll help you with your divorce if you want to leave him. What? That came out of the divorce trial. Oh yeah, yeah. They were worried because I was the first one to bring out the stuff that was happening in the West Coast residential schools. They were doing everything possible to to stop me from from doing that. So. And I mean, going to your wife, that's kind of getting into your personal life a little bit, don't you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I couldn't believe it when I saw it, but I couldn't deny the documents in front of me in, in divorce right. court. They went to her and, and helped her with, with her, her lawsuit. She got custody of both our daughters. Oh, dear. Yeah, and I, I couldn't work. I was blacklisted. You know, it was a very difficult time. You know? mm -hmm. and, and definitely when you come across something that's controversial and not so well believed, I mean, standing up for what you believe in is sometimes very hard. It is, especially when people kind of stand back and say, well, you know, they were beginning to spread the usual smears and rumors that I had mm -hmm. gone crazy, that I wasn't someone to be trusted. So, okay. you know, people, it's kind of like the leper complex, I call it, you know, people don't want to be near you. Right. But, uh, you know, I, I made a point always of staying in on hard evidence. So I posted all of this online. People can read it all. Right. Uh, HiddenNoLonger.com hidden no okay. is a website. It's got all the documents and people's testimonies about a lot of these crimes. Right. Right. Um, so you stand up for what you believe in 
know, the church, you are 100 percent sure, was completely aware of what was going on and was covering it up. Very much. I mean, letters uh, published on that website show as far back as 1920, uh, Indian agents and priests saying, we know the children are dying at a huge rate, but we can't close down these schools. The churches wouldn't like it. Uh, when they were taking children who were healthy and deliberately housing them with kids dying of tuberculosis and then never treating them. Really? That came out, you know, their own doctors admitted that in letters. You know, so we printed all these letters. So why, I mean, why was this happening? We all know that there was a lot of Native abuse, um, especially originally when the Pilgrims kind of came. Um, but yeah. the Canada, America has apologized for that. Um, they've given them a lot, of, um, a lot of help now. I mean, they exempt them from taxes here in Canada, that kind of thing. So why was this happening? Why were they trying to completely get rid of them? Well, the short answer is uh, in Canada, the railway Link the country in 1886, right. and they had to get the Indians off the land quick. Okay. To get it settled, they wanted the lands and resources, and and it was a deliberate plan to force people off their land, force them onto Indian reservations, into schools. You know, that's how you wipe out a people. It's it's happened all over the world. The same right. pattern. Um, about you know the, today the situation with natives is actually not very good. I mean, only Indians on reservation don't pay taxes. Three quarters of natives live off reserve. Ah on the streets in really bad conditions so mm -hmm. you know what you see on tv about the you know the native world isn't very accurate i mm -hmm. mean the people i work with on the streets of vancouver mm -hmm. it's not unusual for them to die in their 30s and 40s from diabetes you know right. police uh, brutality uh, poverty and disease i mean this is a real third world society you know so all of that can be traced to this history of what we did to them the way we destroyed their culture and their children deliberately now, this is not, I mean, it is your cause now, but when they originally came to you with these documents, was this your cause? Do you have any native blood? What was your link to it? Or was it just moral, moral upstanding? Well, my family are from Scotland and Ireland originally. We have relatives in Winnipeg who are Métis and Cree, you know. Okay. Uh, I think anyone in Canada, if you look back far enough, has some kind of link, you know, right. to Aboriginal people, especially in the West. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I just... You see, this is really about uh, my culture, what my church at the time and my culture did to other people. So I feel a moral responsibility for looking at that, right? And so I don't think you have to be Native to be concerned about this. You didn't have to be Jewish to be concerned about what happened in Europe absolutely. in the 1940s, right? And I mean, certainly there, I mean, if we go all the way far back, uh, 1000 AD, the 1400s, there was a lot of corruption in the church. Um, yeah. We had popes with children, all of the cardinals were sleeping with someone, there was nepotism going on, all that. But the, the the church has since uh, come forward and apologized for all of this and claims that it's not going on anymore. So well, that's just that's just not true. And an example of that is the Pope who's in power now, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, or Pope Benedict. Mm -hmm. He signed letters three years ago. He signed letters to American and Canadian bishops all mm -hmm. over the world, actually, that said they were ordered to cover up sexual abuse of children in the Catholic Church when it happened. There's right. even a law in place in the canon law in, in Rome that says <coughs> any, any priest who doesn't cover it up is going to be excommunicated. Huh. So, in other words, priests are told all over the place, if a child's raped in your congregation, they're to be silenced and the police are not to be told. That's a crime under the law. Uh, absolutely. Raping anyone, let alone a child, is a crime under the law. What is the church's motivation for covering this up? Protecting themselves. It's so widespread in the church that they realize that, you know, that they're trying to save money and their mm -hmm. reputation. They just think they can throw it all under the rug mm -hmm. and people will forget about it because they're the church. I mean, I went through this a very similar thing. Right. Uh, you know, it was one man's voice against the entire church. Who right. are most people going to believe? Absolutely. But you can't deny the evidence. I work with survivors of these crimes all over the world. Mm -hmm. I've been to Ireland, to Italy, to England, to the States. You hear the same stories, the same cover up everywhere you go. Um, now, you have a specific number of Native children you believe were actually murdered. What is that number? Well, I say that over a century, probably at least 50,000 children died in these schools, which actually isn't very big because uh, that's only five deaths every year in every school. Okay. And the government themselves admitted that half the children were dying. Mm -hmm. As early as 1920, the, the head uh, of Indian Affairs, a guy called Duncan Campbell Scott, okay. said half the children are not surviving in these schools. Mm -hmm. and, and that in 1949, 30 years later, they're saying the same thing. So you, why do you get the, that kind of death rate over so many decades unless it's deliberate, you know, unless they're trying to depopulate the country of Indians? Now, perhaps you can give us um, a little bit more background. Children were sent to residential schools to get rid of their native culture? 
That's right. A law came in in Canada in 1920, federal law, so every child seven years and older had to go to uh, into one of these places or their parents would go to jail. Right. And the parents had to even sign away the guardianship power over their own kid to the church. Wow. So they lost all legal control over their own children. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were put in these sub yeah, in cold, uh, underfed, unhealthy conditions. Uh, most of them never got any schooling. They had to go to work, you know, the girls as domestics, the boys out in the field. Uh, horrible stories of torture and reg daily rape. Uh, farming these kids out to local uh, pedophiles. You know, I mean, I hear these stories every day from survivors and mass graves. And you know, we've documented 28 sites in Canada where there's graves near the former residential schools. Uh, and we've already started doing some surveys and sure enough, mm -hmm. it looks like that there's, there's bodies in these places. Now, <clears throat> not, to kind of play the devil's advocate, are you proving that these bodies are native? Because I mean, Canada has been here for a very long time um, and it was um, culture way back when to actually bury mass graves. So do you know these are from the residential schools specifically? Yeah, we do. For example, uh, the first place we began to dug is in Brantford, just south of where you are, okay. at the Mohawk School. It's the Anglican Church. It's the oldest residential school in Canada, going back right. to 1832. The elders there, the Mohawk elders, gave us permission to go and do a survey and a test dig. We, last November, we found remains of bones and buttons. And a, a woman who went to the school said that those buttons were from the uniforms of girls in the 1950s in the okay. school. We found them tangled up in the roots of a tree and she said that whenever they buried a child, and she saw this happen, she was a witness to these burials, whenever they buried a child who had died, they planted a tree on top huh. in order to cover up the remains. And sure enough, there's buttons from clothing in among the roots of these trees. We found other bits of clothing and bones, which we've had analyzed, and um, there's not an agreement. There haven't been enough samples to have a conclusive uh, you know, yes or no, whether those are human bones, but some of the forensic people I've talked to said that they believe they're definitely human. We're, we're in the process of having more of these bones analyzed. Okay. So you're, you're definitely in the, in the works of confirming this. Yes, and uh, especially since people working with us are eyewitnesses to these burials. Right. One man there even buried children. He said wow. they were dying at a... We found a letter from uh, Principal Zimmerman in the, in the uh, school in Brantford that says in 1948, uh, we have to start burying children two to a grave. That's a direct quote out of a letter. How many kids are dying that they have to start burying two of them in a grave, you know? Yeah. Um, now, these letters are on where? Which website of yours? Uh, that letter is in the possession of the Mohawk elders. Okay. They're sitting okay. on the evidence right now, but those kind of letters are actually all through... Uh, my book, if you want to read it, hiddennolonger.com. Okay. It's up online. Now, why why are they hiding the evidence or sitting on it? Are they waiting for the proof of the bones, or what's going on there? Well, they've been threatened. Uh, the uh, the government, the, you see, the, there's the traditional elders, but then there's the government-funded tribal council. They get a lot of money from the government. Right. And they were told uh, that the government did not want them digging there. Uh, the Anglican Church was very upset that they were doing that, and people have been threatened. We've mm -hmm. had Mohawk elders who were told that they're going to lose their funding, that they're going to be, you know, even their lives are in danger if they go digging around that school. That's mm -hmm. not unusual. That's happened all over the country whenever people try to do this. So, you know, I mean, it's that simple. Uh, you know, it, it's it's what you can expect when people start unearthing these crimes. That, that, this is recent. The last school didn't close till 1996 in Canada. Right. Yes, it was. It was very recent. It was. Yeah. Um, it's still. Now, do you think that the the kind of help that was given the natives when Canada made its formal apology, you know, some of you get tax exemptions, some of you get these things, do you think it was meant as an apology or it was meant as a here's this now we'll cover it up? Well, it was a way to uh, placate uh, the lawyers. It was a way to make the world uh, think that Canada was doing something about this. Uh, in reality, Stephen Harper, when he apologized, didn't make any reference about any of these crimes. He didn't talk about mass graves. He didn't even mention the churches. Really? I mean, it's kind of it's kind of like talking about the Nazi Holocaust without mentioning the SS. Which is kind you of know, hard it, to it, do. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the chief people who did it are off the hook. The churches mm. have been uh, legally indemnified. They don't have to do anything besides give out a bit of money. I mean, imagine if your child was murdered by somebody right. and buried, and then the person got uh, away from doing any uh, time in jail by apologizing to the family. I mean, that, that wouldn't be on. Right. But the churches get to do that, right? So somebody explain that, you know. I, <laughs> Now, do you think these children were actually murdered or let to die in poor conditions? Like Both. physically murdered, I mean like violently murdered. Yes. 
Uh, both. Uh, a lot of the deaths happened because they deliberately didn't feed them, they deliberately exposed them to disease, especially in the early years. But it was a general policy to simply ignore the kids when they're in the school. So a lot of them starved. Uh, there were outright murders. There, the first case I ever heard of that, a woman called Harriet Mahaney saw a little girl, Maisie Shaw, kicked down a flight of stairs by the principal, 1946, at the Alberni School, just down the road from where I worked, a wow. principal called Alfred Caldwell. Uh, two eyewitnesses saw that. He was never prosecuted. They never even investigated. The RCMP refused to investigate. Why? Do you know they why? said the perpetrator was dead. They just the Mounties refused to look into these things huh. uh, be, because the Mounties themselves were involved. They used to grab the kids, bring them in from the villages, chase them down when they ran away. You know, all the levels of government and church are implicated in these things, and that's probably why there's been such a big cover up and denial about these things. Do you think the intent of the residential schools was to eliminate the children? Definitely. Definitely. It was to uh, depopulate the country, it was to grab their land, it was to brainwash the kids so they wouldn't, when they were older, stand up for their rights, stand up and try to recover their land. I mean, it's, it's what you do when you're, when you're conquering and colonizing a people. Interesting. I mean, that, that's such a huge accusation to be taking on. It's a, a huge weight on your shoulders. Um, how is the government reacting when you're bringing these accusations towards Well, them? you know, at first they didn't have to react. Before the lawsuits began, they just said, well, ignore this guy, he's crazy. When the lawsuits began, they be then began to say, okay, yeah, it's true these cramps happened, but we didn't intend it. Right. Uh, and now they're admitting even the children are dying, but they're saying it wasn't because of deliberate acts, it's because there wasn't enough funding in the school. They're trying to continually evade uh, their responsibility for these things, but the proof is in the numbers. You don't get half the children never coming back from these schools unless it's a whole deliberate plan over many years. Absolutely, and it's a huge number that you're, you're trying to bring forward. So when we come back in the second segment, we're gonna talk about the other causes that Kevin's taking on and some of the action around the world. So go get a drink of water, fluff your pillow, walk your dog, whatever you need to do to be comfortable and come right back to check out this second segment. Catch you in a moment. All right, welcome back to The Elephant in the Room. I'm Jasmine Bowen. We are joined by Kevin, who's got a lot of great things going on, taking on a lot of causes. So before the break, we were talking about uh, these mass graves of children, the residential schools being um, completely used as a tool for murder. Now, what other causes are you taking on with the church? Well, one of the things I've been working with recently, Jasmine, is I was uh, recently down in New York meeting with survivors of Catholic Church abuse. So these are people who are being raped or hurt in some way nowadays. I mean, these are fairly young people who are being harmed uh, by priests and by others. And they're trying to sue the Vatican. They're trying to bring lawsuits against the churches for things happening right now. So I'm more and more working with those kinds of people uh, because unfortunately these, these crimes didn't just affect Native people, they affected lots of different people. Um, you know, you probably heard a little bit in the news about the lawsuits, how the Pope himself is, is being sued. Yes. Uh, there, there's an attempt by New York lawyers to sue him in the International Criminal Court for actually obstructing justice, for ordering priests and nuns to cover up evidence of, of child abuse in their churches today. Mm -hmm. So this is a pretty serious crime, and, and that's why... Uh, something that happened, you know, 800 years ago. This is still that's happening. Right. That's right. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's the kinds of things that I realized that it isn't about uh, history only, it's about what's going on today. Right. Um, and now the Vatican is a, a very big power to take on. And I mean, it's not as powerful as it was way back when, but it's still a huge power. Do you think that you'll have any effect on them? Well, I know I will, because two years ago I went to Rome, I held a protest right outside the Vatican, mm -hmm. and all the media in, in Rome were there to cover it. It's not like over here where the media, mainstream media tends to black the story out. Right. Um, the all the TV and radio and newspaper people were there. They were fascinated that somebody was taking on the Vatican. Right. And in fact, I, w I was approached by a couple of politicians, senators in, in the Italian Chamber of Deputies, who sat down with me after and said that this Pope was not popular, that a lot of people want to see justice done. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I think there's a lot more support out there, even in the church, uh, for there to be a real uh, house cleaning. And uh, for, you know, these policies to be changed that allow child rapists to, to be protected and, and uh, given sanctuary in the church. Now, what is, what is justice done to the Pope? Because in the 1400s, that would be murder the Pope and elect a new one. But it, we're in a little bit of a different time. Well, you know, um, there's uh, a lot of talk about him resigning, mm -hmm. uh, this Joseph Ratzinger. And uh, there's some cardinals in Rome who actually want him out. Mm -hmm. But the thing to understand is even if you remove the Pope, the structure is still there. There are these laws 
called, there's a law, it's called Crimen Solicitanus. It's a legal Latin name. And it mm -hmm. says that when there's children harmed in a church anywhere in the world, any Catholic church, the priest has to cover that up. They're, not, they're to tell, the, uh, impose an oath of, of silence on the victim. Wow. And not, and not tell the police and go to the parents and say, mm -hmm. you know, don't press charges or you'll be excommunicated. Right. All of that pressure brought to bear to protect the rapist and to silence the victim. Right. I mean, that's a crime trying to do that in itself. And yet any honest priest has to either do that or be excommunicated. Right. So that, that's intolerable. I mean, why, why should taxpayers support churches that do those kinds of crimes against children? Now, Kevin, there are a lot of people who, I mean, very much believe in the church. It's their backbone for everything. And taking on the church, all of the churches, is a huge job for you to do. Um, now, I understand that you um, are involved in, or at least kind of oversee protests all over the world. Yes. Yeah, we, there have been uh, actions, uh, you know, in, in Ireland, England. Uh, I spoke at a big child abuse rally in Trafalgar Square mm -hmm. in London uh, just last year. And I'll probably be going back there again in the fall to do that. I mean, uh -huh. the, the truth is, is that this is not an attack on people's faith or religion. Right. This is an attack on the, the hierarchy in the church, the policies, you know, the corporation, if you like, that's um, making everybody go along with these crimes. And even taxpayers, I mean, just in Stephen Harper's budget that was released recently, he gave $83 million to different churches in Canada, 60 million of that, so three quarters of it, right into the pocket of the Catholic Church. So why are taxpayers in Canada subsidizing these, these churches when they're committing these crimes? I mean, this is something that, that should be raised in Parliament and should be questioned, you know? Now, you definitely have to make sure when you're all over the world that you keep a hold on um, the fact that you guys are doing the right and you're not just attacking for the sake of attacking. I know there was a protest recently held in Toronto, um, and there was, on that email, people at the protest were told um, to park at the church so they didn't have to pay for parking. Um, oh, really? I, I didn't hear that. Yes. Was that, uh, was that the Occupy people? Uh, it's possible, yeah. Um, it was the one recently hold, held in Toronto. Um, oh, yeah. Now, is it hard to keep a hold on the quality of what's going on? Because why, why is the church good enough to um, use its space and not pay $15 for parking in downtown Toronto? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, the, the thing to understand, at least in, in terms of the people I work with, yes. there's a lot of justifiable anger. Yes. You know, when you beat raped by a priest and told to cover it up, you carry that horrible pain with you your right. whole life, and nobody wants to hear you. Right. Um, that causes a lot of anger. I'm, I'm in fact surprised there hasn't been more acts of violence, you know, against the church and against right. these these individuals who caused it. But uh, all we're saying is, if you do justice, mm -hmm. and for example, uh, when a, ch a priest has raped a child, they should not be allowed to to be in the pulpit anymore. Mm -hmm. They should be defrocked. They should be publicly licensed like anybody else, so that if they well, harm a child, yes. their license is removed. Moved. Uh, if you do justice, you're not going to have mm -hmm. this kind of thing go on. So that's all we're saying. Yeah, it, and it must be, I mean, very hard. You mentioned to me that you're all over the world. Um, and to take on the church is such a huge responsibility that you have to make sure that in every little pocket, you guys are being moral as as well. So that's why I wanted to bring up this little fact um, that the church was being used for parking space, but being attacked at the same time. Yeah, I, I don't know about that incident. Uh, we, we try to always stand on the moral high ground. Mm -hmm. We never attack people individually. We never incite people to violence. We make moral appeals to people in mm -hmm. the pews. Right. Uh, you know, when we do that, say, this is not the way Christians should be acting, covering yeah. up crimes, allowing ch children to be raped and, and done away with. So that's we've always taken the moral high ground. Right. Um, yeah, are th which you can do when the truth is on your side, right? Absolutely. Um, are there people in your uh, in your organizations, I guess, who are still very much, you know, believing in, in religion, but believing it's gone astray? Some people. Some people are atheists. I mean, we have a whole range of opinion, okay. which, which is good, which is what you should have. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really think this is about trashing God, mm -hmm. uh, I think that, or, or people's faith. I think right. you know, if you follow the teachings of Jesus, he said if a ch anyone ch harms a child, they should have a, a millstone tied around their neck and should, they should be thrown in the ocean. And I mean, and that's yet, not and, even Jesus. I mean, common sense is don't do harm to other people, right? Exactly. No matter what religion you are. Well, especially children who are our yes. future, they're, they're innocence. And, and uh, Jesus said the, the kingdom of heaven, uh, to be a, go into the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be like a child. I mean, mm -hmm. so I mean, all we're saying is the church, the church should follow their own teachings, follow right. the Bible and not what's expedient. Um, can you, a typical protest, like I know you recently did Occupy Vatican, 
which is, I mean, a big thing to take on. So you have no violence. Are you um, chanting? Are you handing out pamphlets? What's going on in one of your protests? Well, the typical protest, we have the banner we carry with us. It says, all the children need a proper burial. Okay. Uh, we'll stand there. Uh, when we're invited into the church, we come in. We, I've, I've spoken from pulpits sometimes after being invited in. Wow. We hand, out, we hand out information to people. We pray with them. We have vigils. They're not protests so much as uh, vigils and uh, and memorial services. Okay. So, you know, that's that's what, at least in terms of the work I'm doing, the atmosphere I try to create. So you're actually being invited into these churches to say that the organization is doing wrong or did wrong? Well, that's right. I've had invitations from individual priests and ministers to come and do that. I even had a Catholic priest in Ontario who, after he heard me speak, uh, Drew, they, they agreed their congregation was leaving the Catholic Church and they're going to wow. operate on their own. So these are Catholics, they're just not tied to Rome anymore. They don't want to give their money to the Vatican and that institution anymore. So, I mean, those are kinds of things that I think people can do to, to show that, yeah, they're still Christian, but they don't want to go, all, go along with this whole history of corruption. Wow, that is quite an accomplishment, and it's true. And I mean, in um, modern day, that is coming out a lot. I don't know if you've seen this show, The Bourgeois, on TV, but it's yeah. um, it's yeah. starting to explain like the the corruption that went on in the church, at least in the 15th century, um, and a lot of that is still happening, and people are becoming aware of it. Where do you see the future uh, for yourself, for your organizations? What what's kind of coming down the line? Well, you know, I'm uh, I'm 56 now. I started this 20 years ago, and I'm really happy, deeply happy inside because of so much that's changed. Right. So many people are talking about this now. We forced the government to at least issue a, an apology. It may not have been much, but at least, you know, it may be a first step right. to having this truth opened up. I'm very hopeful that, you know, uh, I think my story is, should be inspiring to people because it mm -hmm. shows that even when you take everything from somebody, if they persist with the truth, they can move mountains. Right. And uh, that's what's happened. And thanks to a lot of survivors who come forward to and work with me. So mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a story that more people should hear because it shows that you can make a difference in the world. Now, what, what is the ultimate like, goal or, or dream, I guess? Well, I think uh, making sure that these crimes don't happen again. Right. Uh, change the church so that it's under public control. It's mm -hmm. not a secret organization unto itself. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the native people, we need memorial sites. We need the children given a proper burial. Mm -hmm. We need this in the history books in our high schools so that we can learn the real history so that it, we don't repeat these crimes. And I, I think we need a war crimes tribunal in Canada to put the people on trial who did this. Mm -hmm. I think that's the real way for change to happen. Are you looking to change the church or to take it down? I mean, there are two different words there. Well, I think the church has taken itself down. Ah. By its actions. Uh, you know, I think we need to, my personal belief is that people can be Christians without needing a church. You can meet in your living rooms. That's how the church started anyway. Right. You know, small little house churches. People just need to live in the world uh, with love and respect and yes. justice for one another. That's the person. important thing, not what you call yourself, right? Right, absolutely. And um, I, I assume through this belief you're able to work with people of many different faiths. Uh, oh, especially beliefs. many, many different faiths. We have Muslims, atheists, uh, Jews. A lot of Jewish people relate to what we're doing because they went through many of the similar yes. things uh, in Europe. You know. Yes. Um, why do you think it took the natives kind of so long to be able to come out and have a voice? Why did they not speak up when it was happening and they noticed their children not coming home? Some of them tried, but they had no rights under the law. If they spoke up, they would go to jail. They might even get killed for it. Uh, we've had three Native people in our network in the last few years die, one of them beaten to death by Vancouver police. Wow. Uh, in 2009, Bingo Dawson. So, I mean, look, there's a price to pay when you're a Native person. I'm white, so I'm protected. Yes. Uh, if I was Native, I'd probably be dead by now, quite frankly. So, you know, there's a lot of fear and intimidation, but nevertheless, people are still confronting that. And uh, I, I think that's changing, especially among younger Native people. Do you see in the future perhaps the, the Vatican either completely changing or, or being erased from the um, corporation of the church? I think uh, that's on the horizon. I think more and more Catholics are waking up to realizing that, you know, why should they give their money to an institution that, you know, invests in the arms industry? You know, the, the Vatican Bank is, is uh, extremely corrupt. The money, they launder money for the mafia. There's been a lot of stuff written about this. There needs to be a real house cleaning. And mm -hmm. uh, the last pope who tried that died after 30 days in office, Pope John Paul I in 1978. People wow. think he was poisoned. Right. Uh, and but, this is not the first time a pope has been suspected of being poisoned. Exactly, yeah. So um, do, you, do you see the churches becoming separate 
in themselves or like each church operates by themselves or will it be another corporation form that perhaps is more moral? Well, you know, Jasmine, it's really hard to say what might happen. I think the important thing is that people on the ground who sit in the pews mm -hmm. who put money in the collection plates, they have to keep the church honest. They have mm -hmm. to say, you know, take back the church, mm -hmm. take it back from these right. full time people. You know, when I was thrown out of the church, the people who were trying me weren't the ministers, they weren't the people in the pews, they were their lawyers and the public relations people. You know, right. they don't speak for all Christians, so I think people need to take back their own churches. A lot of this is a really um, modern day approach, actually, because way back, you know, when the church was started, it was, this is the authority, you don't have a voice, you don't have a democracy, but now, in modern day, when people are being told to think for themselves or think... Um, however you want, these views are coming about. Um, do you see any of this going too far? Um, for example, in the case with, with Luther, um, Luther told people to think for themselves, but he didn't mean for riots and death. So do you see thinking for yourself going too far? No, I don't think we're going too far. I think people naturally might take it too far, other people. I don't have any control over that. Mm -hmm. But like I say, we have to keep the moral and spiritual high ground. And, and uh, we are talking about a, a new reformation. This is very much... Uh, what's on the agenda now, and I see it happening everywhere. Mm -hmm. Would you like to return to the church at any point if it changed? Uh, no, morally, I don't think I, I definitely know I couldn't go back okay. into the United Church knowing what they've done. Uh, I wouldn't feel that that was right for me to do. Uh, but I still very much consider myself uh, not a big C Christian, certainly a follower of Jesus, somebody right. who's trying to bring about what he called the kingdom of heaven, which is right. just that we live in peace and equality and love with one another, and, and we stop destroying each other. So, you know, I, I, it's, it's a big enough job to try to do that every day in your life. Absolutely. Now, which, which are you working with a specific um, Native tribe, or is it kind of all across Canada? It's across Canada. We've okay. got the endorsement of the Squamish uh, traditional chiefs on, on the West Coast, the Mohawk uh, Confederacy around Brantford, some of the Ojibwe or Anishinaabe people in Winnipeg. We've got endorsements from a lot of Native groups, but not the government-funded chiefs. They right. tend to be uh, hostile. Right. Um, what are you kind of getting from it? Because I imagine you speak to the Native communities a lot. What do they specifically want? I mean, obviously an apology. Do they want completely equal? What, what's going on? What's coming out of them? You don't hear a lot of talk about money or, or apology no. from people on the ground. You, what you hear is, I want my story told, I want to be believed, I want to see justice done, I'd like mm -hmm. to see these people brought to trial, and we want our relatives brought home for proper burial. Those right. are the demands. I mean, I didn't create those demands. That's what people were telling me all the time in the healing circles. Mm -hmm. So I'm just giving voice to that. Right. Uh, it's, it's, you know, what I ask white people is, imagine if this happened to your kid, what would you want? Right, you absolutely. You want the person tried? Yes. So why have a different standard? It's, it's the same mm -hmm. thing anybody would want if, if it happened to them. You know? Now, where is, obviously a lot of this costs a lot of money. So where is your funding coming from? Entirely from the community. Okay. Uh, I work as a, a freelance minister. I do funerals and weddings and that. So, you know, I bring okay. in there's, that. There's some uh, stuff, yeah. <laughs> you know, from the lecture circuit, uh, but a lot of donations. Whenever I travel, it's entirely from what people have donated. Okay. And uh, this is what's, I think, keeping me and the whole movement honest, is that we're not funded by the government of the churches. We're just right. funded by the people on the ground. Now, you wrote a book. Um, we talked a little bit about it. Can you tell us a little bit mo more about your book? Well, there's several books. Uh, there's Hidden No Longer, Genocide in Canada, Past and Present. Okay. And uh, that's all of the evidence. It's eyewitness statements, it's pictures, it's documents like sterilization laws uh, showing natives who could be legally sterilized in Canada, the enormous death rate, a lot of these death records, all of that's in hiddennolonger.com. Mm -hmm. um, but also I wrote another book about my story. It's called Unrepentant Disrobing the Emperor. You can get that on amazon.com. Um, we also did a film, which you can see online at hiddennolonger.com. It's called Unrepentant. And it's been all over the internet for five years. It's one of the things actually that forced the apology. It really is a very powerful tool. So really urge people to go online and look for that film Unrepentant. All right, well, um, just before we close up, is there anything that you want to leave us with, Kevin? Just to realize that we all have the power to do something here, you know. Uh, if you go to any of these churches, go to the priest and say, I'm not putting money in the collection plate till you give these kids a proper burial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we want uh, people, especially in the Toronto area, to join up. There's a group in Toronto called Friends and Relatives of the Disappeared. You can write to me, uh, Kevin underscore Annett, uh, at hotmail.com if you want to be part of that. And I'll be in through Ontario later in the summer. I look forward to talking to anybody who wants to uh, sit down and uh, work on this with us. 
All right, well, thank you so much uh, for being on the show and for sharing your, your theories and facts with us. I very much appreciate it. Now it's up to you viewers um, to investigate this for yourselves and do what you feel is right and realize you can make a difference. Thank you for joining us on The Elephant in the Room. I'm Jasmine Bowen, and we will see you very, very soon.